Before I get started, I just want to announce a new webinar, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the interplay between persona and shadow, with Peter W. DeMuth, PsyD, and Jungian analyst, on March 5th, 2021, from 1 to 4 p.m. Central Time, held via Zoom. CEs are available for that webinar. For more information and to register, just visit our website, youngchicago.org. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, Analytical Psychology Seminars from the Archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Madness, Religious Experience, and the Wisdom to Know the Difference, with Thomas Patrick Lavin, Ph.D. This episode is the first session of the series, Madness, Religious Experience, and the Wisdom to Know the Difference, from the series description. In the history of humankind, there have always been seeming psychotic features accompanying authentic religious experience, and there have often been apparent religious images and or identifications associated with psychotic disorders. In our transitioning and liminal culture, what Jung has called a transcendent function acts like a balancing pole for those of us who feel called to walk the tightrope between madness and religious ecstasy. This course examines the work of C.G. Jung and others to help develop imaginal strainers to sift the sounds of the many voices which call to us. It explores our perceptions of the presence of the divine in madness and the madness in the divine. Topics in this program include varieties of religious experience, varieties of psychotic experience, higher powers and deeper powers, the transcendent imminent axis, and feeding the ego self-loop. Thomas Patrick Lavin, PhD, is a Zurich-trained Jungian analyst who holds a PhD in clinical psychology and a PhD in theology. He was formerly chief clinical psychologist for the U.S. Army in Europe and is a founding member of the C.G. Young Institute of Chicago. He is in private practice in Walmart, Illinois, and consults internationally on typology, spirituality, and addictions. There will be a link to the entire series in the show notes, as well as links to Dr. Lavin's lectures in our online store and his other podcast episodes. You can also support this podcast via a link in the description or by visiting our website. And now here's the lecture. I was thinking about the introduction, and I was thinking about a picture I saw of Jung. Maybe it's Jung face-to-face. And someone, probably Barbara Hanna, uh, who was very close to Jung, probably told him that the words damn and hell in the English language are naughty. Because I remember John Freeman in the face-to-face film with Jung, and he said, Professor Jung, what do you think about the future? How do you see things happening in the future? And Jung had a glint in his eye, and he said, oh, well, he said, you know, the world is in a hell of a damn mess. (laughs) And then he, you know, kind of looked as though uh, he'd done something wrong in church. Um, And I thought really my introduction, uh, what I wrote, and not all of what I wrote was printed on the course description for space reasons. But I thought, you know, we're talking about a hell of a mess that we're in in this liminal time, not wanting to sound like Professor 
Harold Hill talking to people about River City, but nevertheless, we are. We're in a time of transition. We are in times where people are worried about office buildings being bombed. Uh, Women are being raped in Bosnia. There are shootouts in Texas. And these things are done either supposedly for religious reasons or in God's name. And that's where we are. We're in this situation. If you, if you look at the conflicts that we're facing every night at the 10 o'clock news, and I don't do the 10 o'clock news. Um, I wouldn't eat chilies before sleeping either, or what have you. I don't, I don't do windows, and I don't do the 10 o'clock news anymore. I'm too sensitive a person. Uh, I do catch the 6 o'clock news to make sure that we're all here and everything is normally dysfunctional the way (laughs) it is, um, but 10 o'clock, no. Uh, Also, not only on a global scale, not only are they wacko and waco, But people are also doing physical and psychological violence to themselves because they perceive they've heard the harsh voice of God telling them to shape up or cut this out or cut something off or what have you. So it's a, a collective thing in our culture, but also individually. And yet we've seen that in the history of humankind we can look at the religious experience in all religions and in all times and this is seemingly psychotic uh, or has psychotic features accompanying what are indeed authentic religious experiences. I also remember that I I had the good fortune of working in a mental institution in Switzerland, outside a place outside of Zurich, where they had three Jesus Christs in the institution at the same time, uh, competing with one another, I, I guess. Um, and so it's long been known that there are indeed psychotic features to religious experience and religious experience indeed uh, has an otherworldly out of it aspect to it and so basically what I'd like to share in the next four lectures are some ideas about the presence of the divine in madness in the presence of madness in the divine and what I call the, uh, not I, but the idea of how can you tell the difference? How can you tell the difference for yourself? How can we tell the difference in a culture? And this is a, a very hard thing to do. And in order to do this, we're going to have to talk about symbols and the role of symbols we're going to have to talk about what Jung called the transcendent function, which that particular name I don't think is adequate anymore. Uh, it's not the whole thing. But what I said was in, in our transitioning and liminal culture, what Jung has called the transcendent function is like a balancing pole for those of us who feel called, interesting word, to walk the tightrope between madness and religious ecstasy. And sometimes there's a very thin line. It's very hard to tell which is which. And sometimes it depends on which camp you're in as to whether you call something a religious experience or whether it's madness. 
and brand X or the other people are mad. It it really is very, when you look at the lives of supposed saints, you find all sorts of, and this is, uh, I'm just going to pass this around, it's a fuller explanation than you've got in the program. The lives of the saints, I think if some of the so-called saints, both Eastern and Western, lived today, they'd be given a lot of authority. <laughs> and they would be in a special home or house or what have you. They couldn't fit into the mainstream of our society. And so tonight we're going to talk about varieties of religious experience. Next week, talking about varieties of psychotic experience. What is it like, uh, or how can we name this thing called psychosis? Then it's important, if we're going to make the distinction, we have to talk about higher and deeper powers. The, uh, The transcendent, imminent axis. It's not enough to talk about the transcendent anymore. What I mean by that is that we've come to an understanding of our own religious functions that we realize that our religious function is free to go outward or inward. That the presence of the divine has to be seen as much deep within as high above. What I'm suggesting to you is that the theology of the West, uh, to include Islam, that the theology of the West, Judeo-Christian, Islamic theology, is indeed a theology that is more extroverted, and being so extroverted in orientation, It has made many of us neurotic. It has indeed paralyzed our religious function. On the other hand, some religions of the East are so centripetal and so individual that they can make a person highly neurotic as well. What we're looking for and what we can see from the peak of history, the history of religions in our time, is a balance between these two religious or two directions of religious, our own religious function, our own religious passion, our own religious drives. To use Jung's terms, there is a place in the religious development of a person and of a culture for both introverted and extroverted forms of meaning seeking. Our Western culture has a very strong extroverted bias in terms of its meaning-seeking. To be overbalanced one way or another is to be neurotic. So we're going to, to look at that. One then would have to feed what I call the ego-self loop. Now, the ego-self axis is a term uh, in a book called The Ego and Archetype, an American analyst, Edinger, Ego and Archetype, has a chapter called The Ego Self-Axis. And what he says is that in order to be healthy as an individual, you have to have a relationship between the I and the self with the capital S, which, if we were talking God talk, would be 
the presence of the divine within us. Okay. Which Jung, the best definition of the self with a capital S that I've ever heard, I got in an, a letter from uh, Dr. Marie-Louise von Franz, and we were corresponding back and forth about religious experience. Uh, and she said, well, I guess you know this, the self is ineffable. You can't define it or what have you. But the best I've ever heard about the self in terms of a definition, if one must, that the self is that image of intercourse between the ego and the divine. Nice. Okay. What people have called the self throughout history. Okay. Self just happens to be a convenient term. All right. We have to keep this in mind when we're talking about religious experience. What is the self? What is the ego? And we will be talking about what I call not, not the ego-self axis, but rather I call it the ego-self loop. Because the axis kind of is a teeter-tottery thing as I see it, whereas a loop gives you the dynamic aspect of the fact that the ego indeed feeds the self and the self indeed nourishes the ego. And in the last class, what we want to talk about are ways of doing that, very concrete ways of doing this. Okay, we are on a journey of dialogue between the ego and the self, consciousness and unconscious, however you want to look at it. Okay, and I, as, a, as an analyst, am a grateful daily observer of a variety of religious experiences. Now this, uh, every day I watch the divine burst through the consciousness of my patients through their dreams, through synchronistic experiences, through religious experiences, through active imaginations, dialogues with the unconscious, that the divine bursts through the daily lives of my patients in order to get them to revision those parts of their personal and collective myths that are no longer adequate. I mean, that's a way of looking at what happens when you and I are living the symbolic life. That our versions, parts of our myth, not all, but parts of our myth need to be constantly revisioned, re-imaged. Parts of our stories weren't the whole story, okay? Or some of us, let's say, have dreams often that take us back to, to second grade or so, because although we're 30, 40, 50 years old, we're still holding a second grade opinion of ourselves or an opinion of ourselves that we got in second grade or second year high school. And that has to be revisioned. That has to be changed. And so that there's a constant, I feel that there's a constant change going on within all of us if indeed we take what I would call, and I think what Jung would call, a religious attitude towards ourselves. I've also seen in my practice the religious attitude and the reli what Jung calls the religious function perverted and twisted. I've seen religion or ideas of religion that people have literally ruined their lives where people become very ill because their own religious functions have been snuffed out in one way or another or by one person or another. They're told that they are not the object of divine passion. They can't be, given what they did last night, 
last Saturday night anyway, they couldn't possibly be the object of divine passion. And so our own religious function, our meaning-seeking function, can be snuffed out. And let's not blame only parents. I mean, as a parent, I take issue. (laughs) Parents, you see? And so what happens then? Well, my image is that, that many people come to therapists to get fixed. I think that people come to Jungian psychology rather to have their religious function celebrated, found, affirmed, and contexted. You know, if someone wants to get fixed, they should go someplace else. They're all out there waiting to fix you. Okay? And tell you what's wrong with you. DSM-3 are you, DSM-4 you, <laughs> give you a diagnosis, give you a psychological prosthesis, almost anything. We're all out, okay? Everyone's going to fix. But what if you don't want to be fixed? What if you think you're not mad, you're normal? And they're mad. What about something inside that needs to be found, that needs to be acknowledged, that needs to be given a life context? and to be celebrated. I think that that's why a person probably would come to a Jungian form of therapy. Uh, (laughs) The amazing grace is that my religious function and my creative function were lost and now they can be found. I was diagnosed by my subculture as blind, and now I have the renewed energy and courage to see with an inner vision. The collective is problems with visionaries who proclaim a different vision or way of celebrating the presence of the divine. Now, this has always been so. This is nothing new. Okay, so that you, if you are a mystic, in any tradition, Eastern tradition, Western tradition, you have to stand in two visions and hold the tension of the two. And the two visions are my inner vision and the visions of the collective. And a lot of my inner visions If I'm going to exist in this society, I'd better keep them to myself. Okay? (laughs) Before they institutionalize me. Or I'm kicked out of the house, or the marriage, or the shul, uh, or the society, or whatever anyone wants to kick me out of. It's a very interesting visions, if they're spoken about, inappropriately and at the wrong time tend to make outsiders of us all. And so a good Japanese Roshi is going to be, is really going to respect the vision of the collective. Will not by his teaching or her teaching do injury or harm to the collective. One doesn't have to operate necessarily this way. Jung, since he was a kid, having dreams of God shitting on the Basel Cathedral. Well, you don't tell Daddy, who's a pastor, that one. (laughs) At the breakfast table, as you're eating your Birke muesli, or muslix as they call it here, You don't just say, you know, Dad, I had the most interesting dream last night. (laughs) That just wouldn't have gone in Basel. And so he learned to keep quiet about some of these things. As a matter of fact, 
Jung's own religious visions were a source of pain to him all his life. And it wasn't, he said on a lot of things. He didn't publish a lot of things. Uh, he wouldn't lecture publicly about a lot of things until 1944, when at 68 years of age, he has a massive banger. And he has an out-of-body experience. And the conclusion of this vision, which you can read in his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, the conclusion was, I'd better really t be authentic and say what's in my soul and in my heart to people and take off my persona medici, my persona of the doctor or of the scientist and get with it because it's breaking my heart literally and so for the next uh, from 1944 until 1961 Jung lectured and wrote about the religious function in many many ways that function which is innate in all of us sort of the meaning-seeking function. Um, and so he had, Jung himself had, a complex about religious experience. This is, it's something we all have. There are certain things that, especially if you're a, you know, a PK, as they say, a pastor's kid, uh, then it's it's uh, problematic. But being uh, raised as a Roman Catholic, I wasn't a, a PK, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, <laughs> but we had our own particular taboos and totems that uh, perjure even to this day. Uh, so all of us, when we're dealing with things of religion or religious experience, we deal with them very gingerly. Most of these things we keep to ourselves. Okay. Uh, because if we speak out about them, we might well be considered mad. Now, sort of synchronistically, I found something. I thought, is there this difficulty of discriminating between madness and true religious experience. Do we have this? Can we point to a place in the New Testament where this can be found? And uh, only the other day, actually, I synchronistically found a text that I think is right on the money. It's Luke 7, 31. Um, and here it is. What description, then, can I find for the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like the children shouting to one another in the marketplace. We played the pipes for you, and you wouldn't dance. We sang dirges, and you wouldn't cry. For John the Baptist comes, not eating bread, not drinking wine, and you say, he's possessed. The son of humankind comes eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom has been proved right by all her children. Very well. I mean, that, doesn't it sound like a non sequitur? Wisdom has been proved right by all her children. And yet, indeed, if you make and you look at the, the quotes that Jesus is using from the Hebrew Bible, you can begin to go into more deeply and to understand what Christ is talking about in terms of both he and John the Baptist 
not conforming to the religious persona expectations. Okay? We all have religious persona expectations. Someone I know recently got off the elevator at a hospital, was going to see a relative who had had very serious surgery. She was very distraught. She got off the elevator. This woman came up to her and said, Who are you? Who are you going to see? And what are you doing here? What is the room number of the patient you're going to see? And what's the patient's name? And this woman said, Who are you and why do you want to know? <laughs> Especially seeing that she was in the middle of New York City at Sloan Kettering Hospital. Who are you and why do you want to know? And the woman said, Ha! Huh, you don't trust me, and walked away. <laughs> Later, when my friend was complaining to uh, someone at the nurse's station, she looked over, and there was the receptionist seated there, who was the one that came up to her. No, she wasn't the, I'm sorry, she wasn't the receptionist. She was the chief of nurses sitting there. You're filling out some form. And my friend said, there you are. And the other nurse said, why weren't you wearing your badge? Had the woman been wearing a badge, it would have made a, who are you? What room are you going to? And what's the name of the patient you're going to see? Would have made eminent sense. Without the persona, she's another crazy nut in New York, walking around hospitals, asking people what the hell they're doing on the sixth floor. Mm -hmm. Do you see how important persona is in our society? Now, we have a persona that we have established, society has established, for religious functionaries. Okay, and so people get very disturbed when they find out that people are acting out. They get hyper disturbed out of persona. <clears throat> okay, so John the Baptist comes and does not take part in the liturgical services of his contemporary Judaism <clears throat> and lives outside of the holy city and sacred place in a desert, he's got to be possessed. He's got to be possessed. This guy from Nazareth comes along, okay, he's eating and drinking and schmoozing and healing on the Sabbath, and they say, ha, 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 no, uh-uh. This is a drunkard, a glutton. He talks with sinners. Even worse, tax collectors working for the Romans, Caesar Incorporated. Who can believe this man? That's to what can we... You see, we demand not only a badge from religious functionaries, our priests and our prophets, but we demand that they act affectively, emotionally, in a certain way. Okay, and so back to the quote, we played the pipes for you and you wouldn't dance to our tune. Okay. We sang dirges and you didn't cry crocodile tears. Okay? What's wrong with you? You're out of step. You are not meeting. Usually you think, and I think too, that a heretic is someone who is out of the cognitive boundaries. Okay? He doesn't believe in dogma. But I submit to you and to myself that there are, in terms of religious experience, affective boundaries. There are emotional boundaries. 
And if you or I go beyond them at the wrong time and in the wrong place, we are considered mad. Now, when I shared with my older son the title of this, and he's a budding lawyer, I said, the title, Tom, is Madness, Religious Experience, and the Wisdom to Know the Difference. He said, they could sue you for the copyright on that last part. (laughs) I thought, why do you have to? Why do you have to think in such a litiginous way? And the wisdom to know the difference. No, it's not an anonymous prayer. It was, it's said in AA Comes of Age that it's an anonymous prayer, but it was secretly made up by Reinhold Niebuhr, and you found it out here. There you go. (laughs) Reinhold Niebuhr is the, the person who wrote it. For those that don't know the serenity prayer, it's very simple. Well, everybody almost knows it. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And so that's where the last part came from, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, And again, I heed back to the end of the statement of Christ, yet wisdom has been proved right by all her children. So the whole question of wisdom the wisdom to know the difference, the wisdom to discriminate okay, is, is extremely important here. Here we're really talking about Sophia. Here we're really talking about, in common parlance, you hear about feminine intuition or feminine wisdom, that instinct, that Sophia wisdom to know the difference, to discriminate from the collective to what is really human. And so this is is something that we have, have a real difficulty with in the history of religions. If you look at the, uh, any exercises, it's uh, whether they be the exercises in the Upanishads for enlightenment, or the exercises of Ignatius Loyola, that if we look and we follow these exercises for enlightenment and contrast and compare them, we see that we all reach a certain point where we have to ask the question, is that coming from the light side or the dark side? Is it coming from the devil or the angel? Because in reality, they sound so close. Jung wrote a letter to someone that's in the second volume of his letters on page 531, in which he says to this person, responds to this person, to hell with the ego world, listen to the voice of your daimon. It, it has the say now not your ego. It's very strong. Listen to the voice of the daimon within you, the demon, daimon within you. Now, Jung makes a distinction in the Greek between a a demon and a daimonion. And a demon is definitely what we call the devil, the dark side, indeed. And the daimonion would be considered one's own creative spark, if you will, creative spirit. And so that's what Jung was saying. Listen, in this case, forget ego, listen to your own creative spirit. Now we have this difficulty within us. It's this, you know, remember the cartoons, the angel on one side and the devil with the pitchfork on the other side and both are whispering and trying to get attention. And many times we feel that we're torn in an ethical situation. We say, you know, I have a certain feeling, but where is that coming 
from. How can I really decide? Uh, how can someone decide whether someone is crazy or is the object of divine passion? And sometimes it is, I think, it's very hard on the spot to make a decision. Now, it's interesting to me that William James, like Jung, had his own time of psychological illness. Uh, you don't find that very often in, in biographies of William James. You don't find the fact that James suffered right as he was graduating from Harvard Medical School in 1869. William James was in a major depression. He couldn't leave the house for three years. Okay. Uh, and somehow, uh, without Prozac uh, and or so, several other things, Paxil's the new one that's supposedly very good by French uh, Smith Klein. Without Prozac or Paxil or whatever, somehow he made it out of his deep, deep depressive experience. In, in varieties of religious experience, he talks about that. He talks about, and of course not himself, but other people who were very depressed, who heard voices, who were very ill, people like Tolstoy, and how they got out of it. What happened was that... Uh, William James uh, had a nervous breakdown in Germany in 1868, 1869. He, uh, we don't blame the German people for it, but it was. Uh, he was there studying under the uh, Hermann von um, someone or other, no, Helmholtz, uh, the physicist and physiologist. And he came into contact with uh, Kantian ideas, idealism, which certainly was a lot different from the stuff that he got at home. Uh, from his father, uh, he got a whole mixture of religions. His father was a Princeton, Henry James Sr., okay, was a Princeton seminary dropout. Uh, went pretty far and then uh, finally said he couldn't take the ecclesiologisms anymore and left and began uh, working with followers of Emanuel Swedenborg and was very interested in the mythical, the father now, the mythical aspects of looking at the Bible. And he would take Henry and William and traipse around Europe to the new Jerusalem Swedenborgian churches in London and in Paris and in Brussels and so on when they're kids talking about the Bible and mysticism. Do you see the genesis of this? It's important when people write about religion, you need to see it in a, in a story context instead of going right for the abstract stuff. You know, I was like, oh, there it is. It proves our point that we're right and those guys are... Yeah. <laughs> we need a story, you know. People get uptight about religion because there's a story behind this. People right now, we will see between right now, 1993, and the year 2000, the influx of more fundamentalisms okay, is going to happen as sure as we're sitting here, or standing is the case by feet. Why? Because we're in a state of tremendous transition. Okay? What happened in other centuries is that a person 
was in an established pattern in an established way and she or he went out into the wilderness into the darkness into the forest to push the boundaries of reality a little bit and everyone said oh there goes a hero or a heroine hope they'll be okay out there it's scary out there we have our dogma we have our rituals we have this hope they'll be okay or hope they won't be damned in hell for all eternity that was a biggie okay and well, honestly well-meaning people belong to this thing called the inquisition so that these nuts wouldn't put themselves in hell by some of the pushing of the religious envelope you see better to torture them than they burn in hell for all eternity you think this pope is bad Pfft, nothing <laughs> nothing nothing okay and so these people were taking this task very seriously because they knew where things were they had a place to stand on the rock you are Peter you're the rock okay fine wonderful metaphor took it too literally but anyway someone goes out hero heroine we're in a time right now where not, there is no out because there is no in and someone is living the moral codes of another culture or an enemy or whatever and they're not heroines or heroes anymore they're not even nuts anymore. <laughs> well, that's New York. See ya. You, you can do it there. You can do it anywhere. Bye. Going back to the Middle West, and God love you. Okay. What happens then? That there are a lot of people that don't want to be heroes or heroines. <laughs> they get very nervous. Hey, there's no inner voice saying, I want you to be a hero. Mm -hmm. I would like you to be the next Hildegard of Bingen. What? Hildegard of who? Yeah. <laughs> Leave me alone. I got a lot of stuff in Dominic's to do here today. <laughs> that, enough with the Hildegard. Okay. So then what do people do? They go to fundamentalism of whatever. Okay. Islam. Christianity, Judaism. Okay? Like a newborn kangaroo goes into the pouch. Okay? See, what, what, what fundamentalists are looking for is a womb with a view. <laughs> so they need a safe place okay it's true think about it they need a safe place to be in and just kind of peer out a little bit because they're not ready yet in this liminal time you know we've tossed out a lot of things but we're not ready with the new things yet and so like a baby kangaroo many of us and we're not called to be hero or heroine and so we just want to find a place to kind of hang out and watch what's happening. And we could always go back into that old-time religion real quick, okay, and get that enthusiasm that we need to put up with all the mishigas that's going on around us in the world, so all of the craziness. And so we need to understand that many times a person's theory or theories of religion, religious experience, religiosity comes out of her or his own pain, heartbreak, suffering. Okay? So William James was with von Hemholtz. He's exposed to a Kantian view of religion uh, by, or really through a, a guy by the name of Charles Renouvert, 
And he has his breakdown. He has what in the old psychological terminology was called neurasthenia. If you look it up, you'll find it's a major depression. It's fatigue. Uh, it's nervousness. It's loss of memory and energy. But most importantly, a feeling of inadequacy, which comes with any major depressive episode. Okay, so three people in the back row were saying, is that what I hear? Anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> during this episode, he lived in his father's house. He got, William James got a few articles off, but he couldn't practice medicine. And he said, in a good sort of German way, my first act of free will was to believe in free will. And it was through his accepting of the fact that he wasn't really determined okay, that he was able to get better again. To accept one's freedom that I'm not programmed into any form of receiving or searching for the divine for many people begins to mark the beginning of their wellness. Okay, to that they're unbounded, okay, this act of free will. And so we find, for those of you who have been reading varieties of religious experience, we find that he found that the existence of divinity can be established by the record of a person's religious experiences, okay, by viewing it. Uh, and he views religion as a plurality of saving powers. That's how he looks at it. A more of the same quality as oneself, he says. In other words, whatever religious experience does, it's an experience that I have of me in which I find inside of me, me, but more than me, with a capital M. Okay? There's a part of me that's bigger than me. And it heals. And it saves. And he says that's called divine. Okay? In Jungian psychology, it's known as the self. Okay? More. A more of the same quality as oneself. Which, in a crisis a person can make contact. For James, who was working on his own conflicts about religion, the invitation to give the Gifford Lectures in 1902 at the University of Edinburgh was a big deal. And when you made the Gifford Lectures, you've done it, okay, in terms of talking about natural religion. And so he did. He gave these lectures, and it was a culmination of many years of work, many years of experience. It was the first scientific approach to religious experience. And his point was there are varieties of religious experience. There's a plurality here. There's not just an introverted or an extroverted or this kind of... There are many types of experiences of the other. And he classifies them. And he talks about them. And I, as, as I reread the uh, varieties of religious experience, I was just amazed at how relevant they are today. His... Uh, Examples of religious experience are about the same as the examples almost anybody would give. About the same. I was looking for one passage. I can't find it. The hell of it. Um, but it's just amazing. I've summarized it anyway. Um, to be able to see that there are varieties of religious experience, they point to, he says, um, 
the existence of specific and various reservoirs of conscious like energies. This is very interesting. I'll go slowly with this. When you read the summary, the very end of Varieties, he says there are varieties of religious experience that point to the existence of specific and various reservoirs of energies with which we can make specific contact in times of trouble. What did he do? What is this summary telling us? What happened? Here is, here's William James doing exactly what Carl Gustav Jung did. He came to terms with his father's myth. As a child, he'd been dragged around (laughs) Europe by his father, who didn't find it at the Princeton Theological Seminary and went around looking for something that was not as rigid as he got at Princeton. Jung had a father who, as he said, Jung said, broke faith with faith. And so Jung's interest in religion that got him in trouble all his life was indeed not only working out his own meaning, but also healing the meaning that his father never found as a a Swiss Reformed pastor. So it was a double whammy here uh, for both of these men. They came to terms with the myths of their fathers. Okay, I think that's, that's very important. Because really it is, one might think or say, an exclusively patriarchal view of religious experience that can make someone highly neurotic that can give, indeed, a very uh, rigid Procrustean exposition of the religious function can indeed make someone, in the old language, neurasthetic, or as we would say in our language, pretty damn depressed. So this, this is where both men were. It was through their own father complexes that a a revisioning of patriarchal religion became not a nice thing to do, not a luxury, not an intellectual pastime, but a psychological necessity. And we'll break for till 8.15 and then get back to this. I want to conclude remarks with regard to William James' varieties of religious experience, I strongly suggest that uh, you play with it at some time or another. Uh, It's things, really questions he asks, are questions that we ask right now, uh, often very privately. Um, what uh, What is a sick soul? Uh, what is a divided self? What is conversion? What is saintliness? Uh, here's a good one. What is the value of saintliness? What is the role of prayer? What is the role of aesthetics in religion? And then finally in the 20th chapter he concludes that religion is something that delivers us from uneasiness. Okay, so that he sees religion as a deliverance. Uh, and he makes three points in conclusion. The first point is, now remember, this is, this is 1902, okay, before the psychopathology of everyday life and Freud and uh, this is, this is 1902. And he says, His three points are, number one, 
the subconscious is a mediator between nature and a higher power. Well, yeah. Okay. Also sounds like AA talk. But then that's what, or 12-step talk if you want to do that. But it's interesting because when Bill Wilson, the co-founder of AA, had his religious experience, the first thing that he was given after he told it to his doctor, Dr. Silkworth in New York, was a copy of William James's Varieties of Religious Experience. You see, that's where the connection comes in. And so all this higher power stuff in 12-step programs is right out of William James's higher power business. Okay, you've got to really know the history of some of these things. It's a lot of people are in programs or God knows in religions or goddess knows out of re- but they don't have a context for their language you see and that, that's problematic because it makes us unconscious second conclusion is so the subconscious that is Jungians you know you say that in an exam in death that's a Freudian word we say unconscious and distinguish among the personal, the cultural, and the collective unconscious. So we don't, it's not allowed, you know, at a Jungian cocktail party to say subconscious. You really, people kind of look. Uh, So be careful, because that's it. Um, But his conclusion, the subconscious is a mediator between nature and a higher power. Secondly, there is a higher power. Now remember, this guy started out with his sensation and thinking functions as a physiologist and then a medical doctor. Okay, and he approaches this. He had the first lab to look at psychological experiences. In other words, a laboratory to measure affect in the United States of America. Okay, so he's he's graduated from his little boy shorts. He's where's the and after all he's a tenured professor at Harvard. What else could but he's saying there's a higher power, you see? Well then all the religionists became very excited at the turn of the century that you had someone from this godless institution who was saying that there was a higher power. Third, conclusion from varieties of religious experiences is, unfortunately, the language is 1902 language. He produces real effects in nature. But at least nature is there. It's very important to look at, he says, there are criteria of religious experience. As a psychologist of religion, he says there are criteria. There are three things that if you have these three things, you have religious experience. And if you don't have them, you don't. What are they? Okay. The first quality, he says, is lum- immediate luminousness. Okay, a light, experience of light. (coughs) This is, later on, in 1910, a guy in Germany by the name of Rudolf Otto came out with a book called The Idea of the Holy. And in this book, The Idea of the Holy, Otto coins a term, numinosity. The numen, a real experience experience an overwhelming, awful experience of the spirit. Numinosity. Okay? And so, James says, immediate luminousness is one. Second, philosophical reasonableness. We could spend eight weeks just on those two words, but we move on. And the third 
is moral helpfulness. Okay? So those are the three ways. He says the three criteria of whether a religious experience is valuable. What's he doing? He's using feeling function. You've got a thinker giving you criteria as to how you're to feel about a religious experience. Yes? Um, two quick things I want to say about that. The first one is, the meaning is, does he mean literal light? I'm just wondering because I can't see, so it's kind of interesting. No, no, he doesn't mean literal light, but rather inner light. You see, this is, uh, the question's excellent. One of the major problems that we're dealing with when we're dealing with religion is the tendency towards literalness. And so if you say that Mary assumed into heaven, well, then we've got to be looking at the first astronaut. You see? That's it. Mary was the first astronaut, and we celebrate that on the 15th of August. Let's all be there at the launching pad in Jerusalem. Well, that's silly, you say. Yes, but so is it silly to say that any one space is more sacred than another space. That Canterbury or Rome or Jerusalem or Harley Peak in South Dakota is more sacred than your dining room table or your bathroom or wherever you may happen to be. And so this is very, in other words, once you get into the institutionalization of the religious function, then you get into a literalization modality. And so light is light. Okay? If you can't see, then uh, I'm sorry, you're out of it. That's too bad. It's just, okay. just the way it was phrased, luminosity. It just sounded, well, of course. Yeah. But, but the, the other question I was going to ask you, the second one, philosophical reason was, I don't know, I, I question that just because it seems like from my experience with Jung and just from the, the mystics I've looked into, who are we to say that religion has to make sense? You know, it's like um, Tertullian saying, you know, um, we will, the Son of God is dead and buried. We believe it because it is absurd. Three days later, he rose from the dead. This is certain because it is impossible. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm just thinking that the whole notion of, of making it reasonable, it almost seems like you're trapped in it, trying to put it in a box. Well, you're not going to get any fight from me on that. I'm just telling you what William James said, where the three criteria. Okay? I think that reasonableness may indeed be an enemy of the religious function, uh, but that, and as a matter of fact, James contradicts himself because what he says in the very beginning is that uh, psychopathology uh, and a high intellect may indeed be two criteria to have religious experience in the first place, you see. And so he's saying that uh, madness may indeed be an integral part, and therefore that does kill philosophical reasonableness. What what does philosophical reasonableness mean? Uh, You know, you basically, that someone's experience is in harmony with themselves as a person. Okay, it's a very individual thing. And so he says, I love this one, when he's talking about, he gives these qualities on page 32 of Varieties. And afterwards he says, these are the only available criteria. And he says, St. Teresa might have had the nervous system of the placidest cow, and it would not now save her theology, if the trial of the theology by these other tests should show it to be contemptible. And conversely, if St. Teresa's theology can stand these other tests, 
It will make no difference how hysterical or nervously off balance St. Teresa was or may have been when she was with us here below. Marvelous. He obviously has, has read a little bit of St. Teresa and realized that she was nervously off her balance a lot of the time, uh, but that did not detract from her ability to have religious experience nor does it detract from our ability to have religious experience. Now, he defines religious experience, and then that's it. I'm going to Jung. He says, Religion, therefore, as I see it, shall mean for us the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. Feelings, okay, so it's not just an action. Feelings, acts, and experiences of individuals, interesting, in their solitude. You're out with the Boy Scouts on the trail, sorry. Hey, this is a very private thing, this re- I guess that's the inference, isn't it? So far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. This is very important. The word relation. Because in Western religion, Western religion is relational. You have a relationship with God. You see, Eastern religion, you don't got to have no relationship. Okay? Whether God likes you or doesn't like you is really not that important in Buddhism, in Hinduism. Does God like you? That and a dollar and a quarter get you on the L. It doesn't really make that much sense, you see. We have to understand the words that we use to talk about religious experience. I'm not saying that William James is at all wrong by talking about religious experience as an experience of standing in relation to the divine. What I'm pointing out is that William James is definitely in the Western tradition. Religion means relationship. Well, if that's true of William James, then what about our friend Carl Gustav? How would he define religion? You will find this in on paragraph 8 of Psychology and Religion, which is volume 11 of the Collected Works. And here, and I agree with you and I disagree with him, Uh, But who the hell am I? Religion appears to me, he says, to be a particular attitude of mind which could be formulated in accordance with the original use of the word religio, which means a careful consideration and observation of certain dynamic factors that are conceived of as powers. I'll do that again. It's a very important definition. How does Jung look at religion? Okay, religio. Religious experience is a careful consideration and observation of certain dynamic, not static, dynamic powers that are conceived dynamic factors that are conceived as powers. That's the short definition. Then he goes on to say, spirits, demons, gods, laws, ideas, ideals, or whatever name humankind has given to such factors in the world as he's found powerful, dangerous, or helpful enough to be taken into careful consideration or grand and beautiful and meaningful enough 
to be devoutly worshipped and loved. In colloquial speech, one often says of someone who's enthusiastically interested in a certain pursuit that he is almost, quote, religiously devoted, close quote, to his cause. William James, for instance, remarks that a scientist often has no creed, but his, his, quote, temper is devout, close quotes. So Jung is very much aware of William James and very much aware of varieties of experience, okay? He's fighting because he knows that William James is fighting the same fight that he's fighting himself, okay? They're, <laughs> they're soul brothers. There's no question about this. He says, I want to make clear that by the term religion, I don't mean a creed. It is, however, true that every creed is originally based, on the one hand, upon the experience of the numinosum, we just talked about that, numinous, and on the other hand, by the pistis, you know, the Greek word for faith, okay, that is to say, trust or loyalty. So, every creed is based on an experience of the numinosum, and on the other hand, trust or loyalty, faith and confidence in a certain experience of a numinous nature, and in the change of consciousness that ensues. Okay. So now you see Jung's idea of religion, religio to observe, carefully observe and consider certain energetic factors that I conceive of as powers. Use the force, Luke. Okay? If you really look at some of the things that Lucas has done, he's re-mythologized religious experience for our time. Because the old stories are dead. The symbols have turned into signs. Okay? You put an electric chair on the top of a steeple instead of a cross. Aha! What's that? What is that chair? It's an electric chair. Ah, what happened? Well, our founder got juiced for... uh, Something he said. Really? What did he say? Well, he said the Buddha and I are one. Oh, really? Would that be for (laughs) Thorazine? Why did you have to juice somebody like that? It's not, well, that's anyway, and that's why we, oh. Then it's not a symbol anymore. If we know what it is, the mystery's gone. Oh, that's a Christian church. That's, it's a synagogue. Oh, well, then, there you are. How do you know? Well, Star of David. Oh, well, then, fine. Right? And we kind of walk around. We know all about religion, you see? <laughs> know all about religion because we can name signs. But we don't feel the symbol in our heart. We've lost it. Our culture has lost it. And that's what William James And that's what you are talking about. How do we understand religious experience? Are we even having religious experiences? And this, I think, is, is extremely important. And we need to understand these things, uh, I think, from a historical perspective. Last, uh, one thing I didn't mention about uh, James that I think is important is that, that I have real difficulties with his idea of the healthy, happy-mindedness, which he sees as religion. Religion, if you really have religious experiences, they make you healthy. Okay? And... Uh, Religion, the goal of religion is to make a person happy. So he sees this, this happy, healthy mindedness as religious. 
Well, there you are. You're taking one side. You know, what about those of us who are sick, uh, infirm, of body or mind or both? Does that keep us out of the loop then? Okay. Wasn't someone going and dealing with tax collectors and sinners and so on instead of those happy, healthy minded people in Jerusalem? And so, you know, we, we are confronted really with this, this oxymoron, uh, of what is real. Uh, and it's, it's very difficult. So that, I think, uh, is something that you're going to have to look at. You're going to have to look at your definition of religion. What is your definition of religious experience? And finally, where does or do religious institutions fit into that? Do they foster your image and images and visions of religion or not? Are they in harmony with your own spirit or not? If not, why not? And if so, why? But the distinctions have to be made. Now, maybe you're not a thinking type, and that's okay because God loves all the other types. And so you have to then do stories. Okay? They're not Bible stories necessarily, but really look at, reflect on, remember yourself to stories of awfulness in your life. To remember when you knew and you found out that there was something bigger than mom and dad. Something that was awful. Because religion's first function, if we look at the functions of religion, religion first function is the awakening and maintaining in the individual of a sense of awe before the mystery of being. That's the four major functions of of religion. Mm -hmm. And, well, you won't find it exactly in Jung, but I've kind of summarized it. Uh, Jung through a Southside Irish uh, uh, prism. Uh, <laughs> it's the only one I got. Um, and so to see four functions of religion. Religion seen by Jung, as I would read him here, is a system of energy evoking and directing symbols. a symbol system that evokes and directs energy. And that serves four functions. Uno. Awake and maintain in the individual a sense of awe before the mystery of being. Religious experiences are awe hyphen filled. Going back to William James, that luminosity idea. And so we, we, our breath is taken away. It's what uh, Joseph Campbell in one of his books talks about as aesthetic arrest. You see a sunrise or a sunset or a flower or hear beautiful music or uh, or taste a wonderful dish or and your breath is taken away. You are in aesthetic arrest. Yes, the opposite is true. I have been to Dachau. I have been to Auschwitz. There is 
a non-aesthetic arrest, too. That's awful. Okay? Religion, the awakening and maintaining the first function in the individual, a sense of awe before the mystery of being. You ain't got no mystery. You ain't got no religion. Very important. Before 3,500, before the Christian era, you you had only a positive attitude towards the universe. This is the time of, of goddess religions. Then, somehow around 700 B.C., there's a big break. Uh, people have different times for it, okay? There's a big break. After the big break, what happens? Well, people look at religion before the break, and it, religion was seen, and the divine was seen as absolutely affirming we name the divine from what happened in the earth or the seasons or the days. Our understanding of the extraordinary was named by the ordinary. It was time Persephone came back again and greened the earth. It was Persephone's time. It wasn't spring. It was named by these stories of nature. Okay, the divine had earth under her fingernails when we're talking at that particular time. So the early, the primal understanding of the divine is that which affirms absolute affirmation. We see it, we eat, we harvest, etc. We plant, things grow, flowers come up again around the 4th of July or then that split because of people coming in basically the Aryans from one direction and the Semites from another direction and these nomadic people non-agricultural people okay, took things away so God couldn't be God of absolute affirmation anymore like in the harmony with nature religions, we then had dominant submission religions. Remember your ice load, the chalice, and the blade. In which we felt absolutely rejected by the divine. Okay? The thunderbolt, you get out of line. <coughs> That's it. So we went, really, from absolute affirmation and supported on the earth which grew and which was our mother to loss of shock awful terrible experiences in which then the face of God turned from an absolute affirmer to an abandoned type of image and in the primal traditions these are the two attitudes but wait, there's a third way of religious experience. Third way that you find in Samaria and about 3500 B.C., uh, Zoroastrian religion, then later Judaism, Islam, Christianity. And the, the third way is this. Once upon a time, creation was really okay. Everything was fine. There was a Garden of Eden, but there was a fall. Somebody goofed up. Somebody did the wrong thing. And so, you can get back together, if you want, and may restore things if you belong to a particular social group. You can restore things to a good state. Antagonisms will cease. 
There is in the Levantine Revelation 2 the whole idea of a revealed book okay, or code, like Code of Hammurabi. And this will help to restore things back to paradise. You won't be abandoned victim children anymore. The kind of the feeling that we have right now in our culture, everyone's a victim, we've all been abandoned, you know, and we all belong to 12-step groups, and we're all real sorry about being sorry, but that's the way it is, there's nothing we can do about it, and there we are. Well, you're in Samaria at, you know, about 3,500 before Christ, before the Christian era. It's the same story. Okay, that's why Nietzsche wrote, Thus spake Zarathustra, because Zarathustra came at that time, the old man from the top of the hill, to restore things, to put things together again. Okay? And Nietzsche, whom you know, went mad, but was really in a restorative mode. Okay? This is very interesting. Stuff. It's that you, you've got to restore. There was a fall. Things were okay. Do you see where the two traditions, one is bliss with the goddess, the other one is problems with the old man, you know, Hebrew hill god, or Zeus up there with the lightning bolts. Okay, then you have a mediating way. And the mediating way was, well, yes, you had that, but then somebody goofed up, and it's all going to be fine again, trust me. You know, if you belong to the group and wear the ring and buy the hat and see the movie, then you're going to be just fine. Now those that don't see the movie and don't buy the ring and don't sign up, well, we don't know. I mean, they're going to be out of it. If you look at Marxism, you know, it's the same thing. You know, you have the classes and the clash of the classes and, you know, really we have a, a secular progressivism or, or restoration. It's the story of the Hebrew Bible in modern clothes. You had the fall, okay? Uh, and we're moving towards a time when all classes will be united. It's the same story. It's the same archetype, different archetypal image. Okay? So... What do you do with all of this? Well, then there better be a force someplace. And what do you do? What does that force make you do? It makes you <gasps> feel awe. It takes your breath away. Okay? So you're either awed in being affirmed. So nice here in Evanston. I feel awfully good. Uh, I'm secondly awed by the degree to which I'm negated as a person, which is awful or terrible, or I'm awed by the fact that Divine and I are in a restorative participation mystique. Well, yes, that's sort of the priestly thing, okay, of any religion. You're there with God, and God and you are going to restore. I mean, there was the fall, and uh, there you are unless you're a pedophile, and then maybe that doesn't work anymore. Okay? Because you can't be a partner with God and restore things and be a pedophile at the same time. That doesn't work, you see. So how do we deal? Okay? You deal with awe at all of these things. First thing a religion does. Second thing a religion does is it gives a cosmological foundation. It gives us an image of the cosmos through which the numinous dimension of mystery will be communicated. And I could go more into detail. Basically, what this, this is the role of the human psyche through the personal, cultural, and collective unconscious. Okay, that, that science in our time doesn't take away the mystery the awfulness. Science gives us a causal system by which we can come to terms with and amplify the numinous. It doesn't take it away. 
A true science points to the dimension of mystery at the core of its object of study. Any true science will get to the point of mystery if one follows it along. I don't care what the the science is. In other words, it moves beyond cause and effect to that which makes something an epiphany of the other. Something is transparent to the transcendent, imminent force or power. Understand what science does? If it's really a science, it's not a pornography. It doesn't call attention to itself. It's an epiphany. It has you go through biology, through anthropology, through psychology to the presence of the divine in yourself and in all of the cosmos. So religion has a cosmic aspect to it as well. The third function of religion, and you've guessed it, is the sociological function And that is to, and religious experience as well, that is to validate and maintain a certain specific social order of this time and place, of the here and now. Okay? So, you know, if you don't want to be in the here and now, stay the hell out of church. Okay? Because they're going to validate the here and now and the specific social order that is now. And we do that through initiation rites, especially at puberty. Okay, and we find out in initiation rites that deviants are not tolerated. You do the party line, okay? How much deviation can a society sustain? How wacko can they get in Waco? In the name of religion, you see? For Christ's sake. So they have that religious experience has a sociological function. Has to. Or we're dealing with madness, and we have to deal with madness. We must understand that our religious function tells us that, that the social order must support the human psyche. Finally, the fourth function, and... Um, and I'll let you go, or you can ask questions and stay. But uh, Fourth function is the psychological function of religion or the transitional function of religion. And that is to carry the human person through the course of human life over the thresholds which must inevitably be crossed and through which we must pass. The base of the threshold crossing imagery is in the human psyche, which demands threshold crossing for development. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta move. You gotta grow. Okay. Fish gotta swim. Birds gotta fly. This is part of our nature. It's the way things are. Religion is to help us make that transition from one place to another. Transitus. Trans to cross. Situs, place. Okay? So the, the religion is a transitional function, which I like better than Jung's transcendent function, but anyway, religion has that. It helps us with the births and the deaths and the marriages, you know, and so on that the current crisis in our time is that we've separated these four functions of religion. In other words, that the awakening of awe is related to our cosmology, which is related in an accord with our sociology, which is related to our psychology. Now things aren't related at all cosmological and sociological boundaries are no longer rigidly fixed. The person who voluntarily goes outside of the boundaries was considered in great peril and was a hero or a fool to the tribe, to a primal society. Today, the journey 
outside of the boundaries is involuntary. You know, to be a hero, you have to say, I'm right here for the hero. I don't know, but I'm here. We don't get a chance in our culture to raise our hands because they drop the border, you see. So then you think, maybe you're crazy. And maybe we are, okay? But it's a feeling that we have to face the universe in a state of flux, and not everyone's called to be a hero. Not everybody's up to it. We want something to, you know, really to stand on. Um, therefore, someone who, who does move out of, of boundaries, who is on a religious quest or search, is not as considered as much a devil or a fool as she or he once was. Many don't want to go on the path, on the dark path into the wilderness. Many are looking to find a rock to which they can attach their internal Sisyphus so that their borderline behavior will be acceptable, like Waco and Waco. Okay? So to understand that religious experience and religions can be a force of healing and wholeness and resolution of bringing things together, if you think they ever fell apart, or on the other hand, they can make the feeling of isolation and alienation even stronger. Because you're always going to be a sinner or you never are allowed to get out through an initiation rite of the kangaroo's pouch. Okay? You're told that your womb with a, a view is, is important. You never move from, in a religious sense, a religious experience from dependency to adulthood, to a sense of self-responsibility. And self-responsibility means questions like, moving away from questions like, where's my mother and what will daddy say? To how can I do it myself? See, There are people who follow religion and who follow a religious function, but they never go through puberty initiation. They're precluded from experiencing their own internal and external wildness or wilderness. They're neurotic because they did not cross that threshold. And religion can be a force as an institution to be a force to keep people away from being responsible to and for their own selves. So we have varieties of religious experience. Uh, we have to move from the I want to the I sh thou shalt to the I am. There are stages of development of, of religious experience from the I want of the child, the uh, thou shalt, of the adolescent and early adult to the I am of the person who is becoming, as Jung would say, individuated. I'm sorry I kept you a minute over, and we will begin again next week. Thank you. podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.youngchicago.org. Thank you to the 2020 donors who gave at the supporting member level and above. Barbara Anand, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Jackie K. Bryan, Eric Cooper, Judith Cooper, Kevin Davis, 
George J. Didier, James Fidelibus, John Korolewski, Marty Manning, Diane Sherwood, Deborah P. Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Cobb, Gerald Weiner, Karen West, and James Taylor, and Ellen Young. And thank you to everybody else who gave at that level but wishes to remain anonymous. 